more can you can you hear us all right we are live on we are live on youtube all right good afternoon everybody the time is now 706 i am calling to order the meeting of the public works committee monday april 13 2020 we're having our meeting by video conference. We're gonna, let's see. I'm gonna announce the members, the committee members by name. Please uh, acknowledge that you're present by saying present or here. Start off, my name, George Serenides, chair. We also have Barbara Smith. Here. Tom Keegan. I saw him a minute ago. Mr. Keegan, are you with us? We'll see if he comes back. George Theodorides? Here. Manny Langella? Here. Tom Livingston? Here. And we are waiting for Mrs. Young, Darlene Young. Just saw your name. There you go. All right, I see Mr. Young, she's present. I'll acknowledge for her. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six members. We have a quorum. We also have for other council members, Kadeem Roberts. Present. Uh, I saw David Hugelman. I believe he's still there. Yes, he is. And John Kites. I think I've covered everyone. Lisa Shanahan is also present. Oh, sorry to miss. Sorry, I missed you, Lisa. And there you are, and Miss Shanahan. And from Public Works, we have Anthony Carr, Vanessa. I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name. I'm sorry, Valdez. <laughs> Did I say that correct? Valadaris, Yes, very good. Cool. Right there. It was good. <laughs> uh, Jessica Palladino and Chris Torrey. And I see. Monique is present for the minutes. All right, moving on. Please note that the meeting is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube. We will use the roll call approach, which we already did, so I don't have to mention that again. Please mute your microphone if you are not speaking. Please remember to unmute when you would like to speak. For public comment, we have the ability to host public comment in two approaches. One is via email in advance of the meeting. Anthony, can you please confirm if we have or have not received any public comments via email? Uh, we have not received any comments via email. Okay. Yes, we have. Yes, oh, yes we have. Excuse me, I'm sorry. One, <laughs> one comment. Okay. So when we get the public hearing, uh, I don't know if you want to read it off, Anthony, but feel free. You can read it off. And the second one is if we have anybody participating through this new meeting, which at that point, uh, Larry, if you could do the honors, let me know if somebody's on and you can unmute them and they can speak during public participation. Yes. All right, so let's go ahead and start. Uh, we're gonna start with public participation. Uh, sorry, public hearing. Uh, public hearing to consider establishing a $100 fee for residents and real property owners who do not pay vehicle tax to Norwalk to use the transfer station and yard waste site for chapter 94, section 94-19. Do you have anybody that would like to speak? Or if you want, Anthony, you could read in whatever the comment I got emailed was. Okay, I have to go into my emails now to read them out. Hold on one second, please. I, I have it here in case you need it. Actually, Vanessa, you know what? It might be easier if you if you read them if you read them out. Okay, so uh, for the public hearing, uh, the comment is from hold on from Diane Lauricella, and the comment is: I support the portion of Ch Chestnut Street to be named after Cesar Ramirez wholeheartedly. In this case, I believe that the one year waiting period should be waived. I don't think it applied to the item, but that's what she sent us the public hearing. 
Okay, thank you. Larry, do we have anybody that's uh, on the phone or on Zoom that wants to add anything? If, if anyone, any participants that called in or dialed in want to speak, please raise your hand electronically now and we will unmute your microphone. Uh, yes, we do. Anthony Di Pasquale, Angelo Di Pasquale. Okay, Angelo, you have three minutes. No, I apologize. I, I did actually did that by accident regarding it was something for something else. I thought you meant for in general for, for the meeting. Okay. All right. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. All right. There's no, I see no one else. All right. Seeing no one else, we're just going to close public hearing then. We'll move on to public input. So we're going to open up for public input right now. Anyone that calls in or wants to speak through Zoom or uh, just phone, you have three minutes to speak. Larry's going to monitor the time. Please try to keep it under three minutes and keep it to the items on the agenda. George. Yes. I, I have in writing also public comments to the meeting that I can read for record. Okay. Whenever you're ready, Vanessa. Sure. So... It is, all the comments is again from Diane Loricella and she had a couple of comments, so I'll go one by one. So she wants to uh, make a note about the minutes that during my comment notes, please delete the phrase instead of to the three minute public comment and replace with what I said in addition to, to the three minute public comment time. Uh, now for item number five, she says, this one of the waste streams that the Norwalk Zero Waste Coalition feels could be reduced with addition of public outreach and educational materials giving out to attendees related to buying less tox materials and substances when possible. As some of you know, I created the HHW Collection Day for mail Bill Collins as a LWV volunteer back in the mid eighties and hope that public education would always be a part of the collection of this toxic waste stream. More opportunity exists with free information and educational materials. Um, then she has a few more comments on the discussion. Should I continue? Sure. So for the discussion item for wooden and current Dreaming Hollow Executive Summary and Report, please ensure that green infrastructure options are built in and offer for this flood control project. When I attend the public meeting, I was assured that green infrastructure design could, would be included in the solution for this project. Has this happened? It is my understanding that there are grants available for this kind of projects from several sources. Please advise. And then there is another one for the monthly solid waste report that is item B under discussion. I have included an email below, not to be read, but just submitted for the record that I sent after a mid-March conference call related to take advantage of a couple of basically free waste reduction service. I have not heard back from staff or anyone else. The Norwalk Zero Waste Coalition desires to continue this work with the city when possible. While I understand that the corona crisis has disrupted many of our lives and work, I hope that working on this, this, I'm sorry, I hope that working on these opportunities now will create good news for the public in the near future and help us plan for the future. I propose that after tonight that you identify someone to get back to me about the two opportunities mentioned in the March 26th email below. That's it, Chairman. I don't have any more comments from the public in writing. Thank you, Vanessa, and thank you, Ms. Laura Chella. Uh, do we have anybody else that would like to speak? I, I do not see anyone else raising their hand from the public. And I don't see any other notifications either. All right, seeing none, we're gonna close public input and we're gonna move on to new businesses. 
Uh, new business, item number one, approve the minutes of the Public Works Committee meeting of Tuesday, March 3rd, 2020, with the correction that Ms. Laura Chella just made. Monique, I hope you got that. If not, I'll, I'll send it to you later. Can I have a motion? Thank you, Tom. Let the record show Mr. Livingston made a motion. Uh, are there any corrections, deletions, additions? Seeing none, at this time, I'm going to put it up for a vote. All in favor? We have to do a roll call. Yeah, actually, actually, if you could do a roll call for the vote, uh, uh, that's the best way to do it. Okay, we'll do that. Uh, Mr. Livingston? Yes. Mrs. Smith? Yes. Mr. Keegan? Yes. Mr. Theodorides? Yes. Mr. Langella? Yes. Mrs. Young? I abstain. I wasn't at that meeting. Thank you. All right. Moving on. I'm going to move, uh, I'm going to read item 2A and 2B together. <clears throat> Authorize the Mayor Harry W. Rilling to execute an agreement with Deering Construction Inc. for project PM 2020-2. Permanent repairs and surface restoration for a sum not to exceed $488,890, account noted. Item 2B, authorize the Chief of Operations and Public Works to execute orders on the contract with Deering Construction, Inc. for project PM 2020-2, permanent paving repairs and surface restoration for a sum not to exceed $48,889, account noted. Can I have a motion? Thank you, Mrs. Smith. Let the record show Ms. Smith made the motion. Um, <clears throat> before I put it to a vote, Anthony, this is something we do annually, but if you wanna add, can you uh, just tell us a little bit about it? Yes, Mr. Chin. This is our annual patch contract where any disruptions to our pavement, uh, whether it's from a private uh, company, utility company, a developer, et cetera, or even us uh, for utilities or anything in the roadway, that doesn't constitute full paving. So these are usually square patches or they could be trenches, et cetera. Uh, every year we issue a contract. Uh, we had two bidders this year. Uh, one was Deering Construction as noted. The second bidder was PNS and that bid was $576,000 uh, plus minus. Uh, the two bids were received on March 26th. And this was the first electronic bid that we uh, conducted and went very successfully. Uh, kudos to engineering and to the uh, purchasing agent, Shannon Connors. Uh, we were able to do this virtually uh, with no paper, no plans, and, and no uh, physical bid opening. So but we're comfortable with the number. And like I said, the uh, second number was almost $100,000 higher. Thank you. Are there any other questions? You're welcome. Uh, seeing none, I'll put it up for a vote. Uh, let's start with Tom again. Mr. Livingston? Uh, I vote yes. Mrs. Smith? Yes. Mr. Langella? Yes. Mrs. Young? Mrs. Young? Yes. And Mr. Theodorides? Yes. I'm also a yes. Seems all seems unanimous. Approved. Tom Keegan, yes. Oh, sorry, Tom. <laughs> All right, now it's unanimous. Better people. <clears throat> Item 3A and B, I'm going to move those together also. This is a technical correction of the Common Council action of March 12, 2019. Item 7C4, to add accounts designated for retaining wall installations and reclaim a parking lot for recreation and parks, account numbers noted. <clears throat> 3A, authorize the mayor, Harry W. Rilling, to execute an agreement with Deering Construction, Inc. for project PM 2019-1, pavement management program for a sum not to exceed $4,538,688.50. Accounts noted. <clears throat> Item 3B, authorize the chief of operations and public works to execute orders on the contract with Deering Construction, Inc. for project PM 2019-1, Pavement Management Program for a sum not to exceed 
$453,868.85. Accounts noted. He noted that the underlying accounts are from the Parks and Recs capital uh, accounts. Uh, once again, I'm going to move this on. Well, do I have a motion? I make a motion. Thank you, Ms. Young. I'm going to pass this on to Anthony again. Anthony, can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yes, Mr. Chairman. So basically, this is a uh, this is not an increase uh, to the cost of our annual paving contracts, which is what this work falls under. What this is is uh, at the earlier in the year, or last year, I should say, uh, this is for the parking. This is for the parking lot down at the park's garage. Originally, we, we thought that building and resurfacing was the better alternative. After further investigation, we realized that the um, pavement reclamation, which is basically uh, removal and replacement of the full asphalt section, uh, was warranted as opposed to just a mill and resurface. Uh, and also, too, we're going to be making repairs to the existing retaining wall on site. Uh, again, this does not increase the overall cost of the contract. This is merely a scope change. And uh, the recreation and parks capital accounts that the, Mr. Chairman noted will be used to uh, absorb the additional funding required to complete uh, the additional work. That's all, right. all, Mr. Chairman. Are there any questions? Seeing none, I'll put it to a vote. <clears throat> Mrs. Smith? Yes. Mr. Keegan. Yes. Mr. Theodorides. Yes. Mr. Langella. Yes. Mr. Livingston. Yes. Mrs. Young. Yes. And I am also a yes, so that makes it unanimous. Item number four. Approve the $100 fee for residents and real property owners who do not pay vehicle tax to Norwalk to use a transfer station and yard waste site per chapter 94, section 94-19. Um, <clears throat> before I make the, before I put it to motion, I just wanna add that we are just approving the fee. We're voting on the fee. This is now gonna move on to ordinance committee where they're gonna work on the verbiage and make any uh, changes that they deem necessary or if anybody wants to add any or, or change anything in the verbiage, that would be the time to do it. So we are just voting on the amount, the fee itself. That being said, do I have a motion? I have a question. Oh, go ahead. And you made the vote motion. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Young made the motion. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, Darlene. What's the question? So the, the question, what was the fee before? Or was there a fee before? Who wants to answer that? Anthony? Mr. Chairman, uh, there was not a fee before because this, this initiative is part of splitting out the disposal pass, which will allow residents to uh, bring their debris and waste to the transfer station and the yard waste site. Uh, this is a new system since we're peeling out the uh, operations portion uh, from the current section of the code, which is chapter 74, recreation and parks. The, the beach pass was rolled up into one item so for all intents and purposes, we're splitting out the disposal pass and the resident parking pass now with a parks parking pass. So that $100 fee didn't exist. It's part of the restructuring of splitting out the disposal pass and the resident pass okay. between recreation and uh, operations. And, and this, oh, sorry, are, are you done answering? Yeah, I'm done, Mr. Sean. And this fee only applies to people who do not have their vehicles registered in the town of Norwalk. Co correct. So if your car is registered in the town of Marwa, don't have that fee. Uh, do we have yeah. any questions? Tom has his hand up. Yeah, a, a question. I mean, so this is just to be clear. Uh, it's a more of a question. This uh, is Ted, Tom, Please this state is your Tom, name before you speak. Oh, uh, this you. is Tom Livingston. So am I correct that this is subject to approval of the? underlying ordinances tomorrow at ordinance and at the council meeting, correct? Yes. Okay. So Mr. Chair, I mean, there were, there, there are gonna be three categories, right? There's gonna be a resident, and, and Mr. Carr, correct me if I'm wrong, a resident, a property owner, or, or a, a resident property owner and a non-resident property owner, right? Correct. Do you, Anthony, do you wanna answer that? Or do you want Jessica to take that or? 
No, that, I mean, that, that's correct. They, um, there's going to be, if you own real property, or if you're a non-resident, right, and you don't own any property, it doesn't apply. Uh, then there's a resident who owns property. Uh, let's say they, they, they own 10 properties, but they, they, they live really somewhere else most of the time. As long as their vehicle is registered with the city of Norwalk, um, they will not have to pay the $100 fee. Um, they could own 10 properties, but if their vehicle tax is not paid to the city of Norwalk, then they will get they will get charged hundred dollars. They could own twenty properties for all, for all we care. But what the, what is going to happen in the future if this if this passes is that residents will have the option. When I say resident, they can live here and, and vacation somewhere else, or they can have their cars registered, not registered. The point is that they will be able to split out the disposal pass and and the um, resident beach pass. Meaning, if I own ten properties here and I know I'm never going to use the, the transfer station or the yard degree site. I don't have to ever worry about paying that hundred dollars, but I may want to use the beaches. If I want to use the beach and, 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 and or I want to use the yard debris site and not use the beach, then I'll pay the hundred and not the 250 that is going to be before the ordinance committee, uh, which was approved already, but the verbiage is before the ordinance committee for tomorrow. And this might be a silly question, but you said a non-resident. Uh, excuse me, I'm please sorry, say Darlene, your name. Darlene, yeah. So you said resident property owner who does not pay vehicle tax and then a non-resident? What can still use that, okay. the transfer station? Sorry, no, the, the non-resident cannot, but that this, this wouldn't apply. So there's not three categories. Oh, okay. There's only, there's only two. There's okay. either okay. Re residents who own real property and don't have their car registered or residents right. who own right. real property okay. and do have. There I is really I no third, third option. Okay. This is Lisa speaking. I just have a point of clarification. When we say resident to own real property, you could be a renter, correct? If you're a resident of New York, of uh, Norwalk, as long as you're paying the vehicle fee. Yes. So we shouldn't really, it's not really tied to the real estate, it's tied to being a resident who pays a vehicle fee. Correct. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? No. Nope. All right. Seeing none, I'm going to put it up for a vote. <clears throat> Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. Keegan? Yes. Mr. Theodorides? Yes. Mr. Langella? Yes. Mr. Livingston? Yes. Ms. Young? Darlene? Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right, and I'm also a yes, so it's unanimous. Item number five, authorize the mayor, Harry W. Rilling, to execute an agreement with Care, Envi Care Environmental Corp for project 3980 household hazardous waste collection for a sum not to exceed $27,800 account noted. <clears throat> uh, this is a program we've done in the past for many years. This year, we're looking to go with Coalition of Fairfield County, City, and Towns. Uh, I think we have used them in the past. I'm going to pass this on again to Anthony. But before I do that, can I have a motion? Would anybody like to make a motion? Thank you, Mr. Livingston. Mr. Livingston made a motion. Anthony, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, tell us a little bit about it. Yes, Mr. Chairman. So this is the Coalition of Fairfield County, Cities, and Towns. And the eight municipalities are Darien, Greenwich, Stamford, Norwalk, Wilton, Weston, Westport, and Duquesne. So these eight communities together um, have developed an intercommunity agreement, which allows, in its simplest form, residents to bring their household hazardous waste, uh, which is uh, items such as gasoline, lawn fertilizers, caustics, et cetera, uh, allows them to bring them to designated sites in each of those, in each of those municipalities. So there's eight communities, there'll be eight different sites. Um, our site is scheduled for late August of 2020. Obviously that is uh, TBD with the current uh, coronavirus pandemic. Uh, but we did have four bids, uh, CARES was the lowest. And um, again, this is a, a, a program that's been uh, in, in effect for the last few years. Uh, Chris Torrey and Jessica Palladino oversee this program. Uh, it's very successful. Uh, and this year we're gonna allow uh, We've incorporated language into the RFP that will include the ability of residents to give their paints uh, to paint care, 
which is going to be a vendor, a sub vendor of Care Environmental Corp that will take that paint and properly recycle it. Uh, in the past, we didn't have that clause in there because that program did not exist. That program was just recently administered for paints over the last year from Connecticut Deep. Uh, we were basically paying the hazardous waste price for paint that wasn't hazardous. So that's, that's the short form of it. Uh, now we have that clause built into the contract, which means that we'll be paying less to get rid of the paint, which will be properly recycled. And we can either recycle more paint or pay for more hazardous materials because we'll now we'll have additional funding. And that's basically it in a nutshell. All right, Mr. Livingston. No, thank you. Just a quick question. Does that mean for latex and oil base or just Mr. Carr? I believe it was latex and oil, but Jessica Palladino, correct me if I'm wrong. I thought it was latex and oil based paints. So this is Jessica Palladino. Um, the paint care program incorporates specific paints. One of them is the latex paint, oil based paint, I don't believe is on the paint care paint list, that would still be considered a household hazardous waste. So that would be included, would have been included anyway? It would have been included anyway, correct. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? All right, seeing none, I'm gonna put it up for a vote. All in favor, I'm gonna start with, uh, Again, Mrs. Smith? Yes. Mr. Keegan? Mr. Keegan? We may have lost Tom for the moment. Uh, Mr. Theodorides? Yes. Mr. Langella? Yes. Mr. Livingston? Yes. Mrs. Young? Yes. And I myself am a yes. Right now, it seems like we lost Mr. Keegan. I'm gonna try him one more time. Tom, are you there? Uh, he just lost connection. Okay. Oh, there he is. No, he's frozen. Okay. Well, we still have uh, enough. Hi there, you looking for me again? Yes, I am. How do you feel okay. about that? Hey, I'm a yay on that. Okay, so I'm a yes on that, George. Thank you. That's unanimous. Going on to item number six. Reauthorize the mayor, Harry W. Rilling, to execute an agreement between the city of Nawa and TN Bond Inc. to provide construction observation services for DPW capital projects related to the paving program, paving, sidewalks, drainage, etc., for an amount not to exceed $210,850 on a sole source procurement basis. Accounts noted. All right, can I have a motion? Would anybody like to make that motion? Thank you, Mrs. Smith. Um, <clears throat> Anthony, would you like to add a little something on this or still there? Yes, Mr. Chairman. So as, as you noted, this is a reauthorization uh, of the prior professional services contract that was before this committee I believe in March, uh, this is for the observation of construction service, construction service ob observation, excuse me, for our annual paving program. Uh, as you recently know, we've extended our um, paving program uh, for this year with Deering Construction and for continuity of operations uh, as we pave more, because that work actually is progressing very nice. Um, Deering's making excellent progress. So we want to we utilize the current inspector who belongs to Tie and Bond who's been doing our paving oversight for quite some time now uh, to oversee Deering's current work under the PM 2019-1 contract and underneath the extension of the contract, which uh, the committee and council recently approved uh, for $3.7 million. Uh, we did not go out to RFP for this contract. Uh, again, this, this all unfolded right around the same time that the uh, COVID pandemic happened. So in an effort to maintain continuity of operations and to line up with Deering Constructions, paving extension contract. And also since this consultant time bond uh, is cost advantageous to the city uh, in the agenda packets, there's two other consultants that did on this work two years ago and their rates were, were higher than time bond. So it's a cost advantage to the city. Uh, Deering's currently uh, putting out a lot of work and we're having a hard time keeping up. And this consultant is very familiar with our standards and our pavement design. So that's why you'll notice that the change to this agenda item 
the words reauthorized at the end, in the beginning. And at the end, there was a sole source procurement basis. And just so everyone knows, we haven't had a problem. Was that me or is that, was that just an echo or was somebody else speaking? I'm assuming that's just an echo. Um, just so everybody knows, we haven't had a problem with um, Deering or any, or any of the work we've been doing with them so far. Do you want to add to that? I mean, how's it been for you on, on the jobs? I feel like they've been staying with schedule and daring has been on schedule. Uh, we haven't had any quality control problems. Our inspectors, uh, you know, given the crisis that's going on now, uh, Vanessa and her staff have been able to basically attain, uh, maintain essential and non-essential work. And uh, they've done a good job at issuing permits, both non-essential and essential, but that also includes the inspection. So while this is going on, since we have the contractors working, we also need the, the inspectors out there. And that's a combination of city staff and also our consulting inspector, uh, which we need. We discussed this at a prior meeting. Uh, we requested an additional position this year for construction inspection. Uh, we did not get it. That's fine. We were prepared to move ahead anyway with the consultant and we have a plan in place. But uh, Vanessa had her hand up. I saw that. Point. Vanessa, so that's all. Like that. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to also let you guys know that since of last Tuesday, we started our milling and paving program. And we have the inspector from tie and bond already uh, inspecting that work. So we are covering all the sidewalk around the fifth street area with our own junior engineers. They are inspecting that part, but we are staggered with our crew now. So we have this inspector already doing all the paving. So it's the end, the end of the 2019 contract and also the 2020. Thank the you. good thing is that he this will be the third year that Tyan Bond is overseeing the paving. So there is no learning curve for the guy. He's excellent. He's able to keep a very good record. We are right on the quantities that he's keeping track. So that's why we're highly recommended the reauthorization. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions? Seeing none, I'll put it for a vote. Uh, Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. Keegan? Yes. Mr. Theodorides? Yes. Mr. Langella? Yes. Mr. Livingston? Tom, are you there? I got the thumbs up, so I'm going to use that as a yes. And Mr. Scott? Charlene? Yes. And I'm also a yes. So unanimous. <clears throat> Thank you all. Moving on. Item seven. Authorize the mayor, Harry W. Rilling, to execute an amendment with Priority Landscaping LLC to Project BPW 2019 1 removal and disposal of deposit of sediment within the water courses for an amount not to exceed 15,000 accounts noted. Okay, uh, this is part of the ongoing work. And Anthony, you could add a little bit more to that. Mr. Chairman, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this work is related to the uh, dredging, it's the, the, the more proper name for it is the center removal at uh, five drainage channels located at Friendly Pond, uh, June, Keeley, Hunter, and Lloyd. Uh, we've been talking about this for a while, so I think most people are familiar, but if you're not, uh, we're removing sediment from these open waterways in order to increase capacity and allow stormwater flows to get uh, through those areas quicker and, and reduce flooding in certain areas. Uh, this one-time mobilization fee, uh, to be quite honest, is going to be a change to the contract. It'll be a change order. Uh, and this is for the lost time and lost revenue uh, from the contractor who was anticipating starting work in January. But unfortunately, due to the permitting effort from the Army Corps, which I believe this committee was briefed on too, uh, it was very challenging uh, up until about two weeks, three weeks ago, when we succinctly uh, in succession, succession, excuse me, received approval from Connecticut Deep, Army Corps, EPA, and I believe, and we have the local conservation approval already. Um, so basically the contractor could have gotten other work during that time. And we negotiated a price of $15,000 to do the right thing. And honestly, it's the, it's, it's the right thing to do. Um, there was no way that we could have foreseen this permitting effort taking so long. Uh, but I did indicate to the committee 
and to other people that uh, it's not uncommon for the Army Corps to delay things and, and they're jam packed. Uh, they came through at the end, but we anticipated having our permitting in four to six months and it actually took closer to nine. So in fairness to the contractor, while he's sitting idling, not able to bid on other work, we, we negotiated with him and the law department on a value of $15,000 to satisfy the contractual uh, downtime. Uh, do we have any questions? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to put it up for a vote. <clears throat> Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. Keegan? Yes. I'm going to take that as a yes. <laughs> uh, Mr. Theodorides? Yes. Mr. Langella? Yes. Mr. Livingston. Just give me a thumbs up, Tom. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yes. Mrs. Young. Yes. All right, and I'm a yes. All in favor. Fantastic. Okay, where are we? Item number eight. <clears throat> Authorize the purchasing agent to purchase five sets of rectangular rapid flashing beacons from Tapcon Inc., Brown Deer, Wisconsin, for a sum not to exceed $27,900, accounts noted. Just very quick, these are those signs you see at crosswalks for students at schools, uh, the ones that flash indicating somebody's ready to cross the road. Uh, two of these, as far as believe or two of them are going for schools two of them are going to be used for the Norwalk River Valley Trail and one is a spare um, Anthony you're still there is there anything you'd like to add to that Anthony uh, yes Mr. Chim um, you are correct there's five in total uh, one of them is to uh, replace the 25 year old uh, beacon at Fellow Street uh, at Candle Elementary School the second device is to uh, install one at uh, William Street, uh, the back entrance at Nathan Hale. So that's, those are two. And I just want to note too that the one at William Street, uh, there was a lot of customer service, there was a number of customer service inquiries received. Uh, the transportation engineer, Mike Yosak, reviewed the request and deemed it uh, appropriate to install a um, rapid beacon, flashing beacon at that location, and was also approved by the traffic authority. So those are the two beacons. Uh, two other beacons correctly, as you stated, will be installed on um, the North River Valley Trail uh, locations of TBD, uh, but TMP wanted to be proactive because they anticipate higher vehicular and pedestrian volume at the, on the North River Valley Trail, which is why they want to install two. So that's four. And then there's a, the fifth one is a spare, any of the other four that are damaged or uh, don't function properly in the beginning of, of installation. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I forgot to ask for a motion. Would anybody like to move the item? Uh, I'll move it. Thank you, Mr. Livingston. Uh, do we have any other questions? Do we have any questions? Ms. Smith. I don't have a question, but just a comment. I'm just really pleased to see the uh, William Street um, at Nathan Hale included in this. I can't even tell you how many uh, complaints I have heard about that um, area with um, people you know, flying down the street and, and kids walking on that road. So I'm really glad to see this moving forward. So thanks for your work on that. I agree with you. That's a great spot for it. Mr. Okay. Livingston, I think you have- yeah, just, a quick, just a quick question, thank you. Um, these are permanent, right? I was wondering if the, if the fifth one could be moved around or is it just, they're all, they're all gonna be permanently installed? The four of them are gonna be installed. The fifth one is an extra. It's a spare in case we need it, or maybe if there's another intersection that we uh, feel might benefit from it, we could use it there until we, we have an extra one. But th that, that fifth one is technically just going to be a spare unit. Yeah, I was just wondering if it's something that could be moved or once you, it has to be permanently installed. Oh, that is a good question. That's it, Anthony? Okay. Yes, yes, they are, they are permanent structures. And the two that will be installed at the Norwood Valley Trail just to clarify, because I, I left this information out before, uh, it was Maple Street and Union Park. So those are the locations they're thinking about for the um, NRVT. But yes, they're, they're, they're permanent structures, Tom. Absolutely. Right, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, seeing none, I'm gonna put it up for a vote. 
Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. Keegan? Yes. Mr. Theodorides? Yes. Mr. Langella? Yes. Mr. Livingston? Yes. And Ms. Young? Yes. All right, and I am also a yes, so it's unanimous. Can I ask a question though about, are these the same signs please, that the new signs- uh, Please keep? state your name. Oh, Darlene. Um, are these the, the new yellow signs that we've seen put up at different intersections? Is that what these are, that flash, you press the button and it flashes? I believe they're the same ones we have on uh, West Avenue in, so, in the Sono area okay. by the mall. Is that correct, Anthony? Yes, and there's also one installed, um, and Vanessa, I forget, there's one installed on East Avenue, right, by Park, uh, towards the, um, I'm trying to think of which street it is. Yes, so that's right correct. Park, Park it was recently installed by TMP. I would, right. I, would, I would just suggest, because the one that's on, um, um, coming out of South Norwalk in front of Grace Baptist Church in the, um, the Norwalk Senior Center, the Housing Authority uh, Senior Center. Um, folks fly through that. And I know it takes time for people to actually get used to seeing those flashing lights. But um, there's been at least one incident. I, I've actually seen people fly through them as people are trying to cross the street. So I think we just, I, I don't know what we can do to monitor that or just I know if that's something that the school would like to at least take a look at to make sure that people are stopping. And there's actually been one incident where a, a, a person um, uh, had to, I have a video and I'll show it to you, had to actually um, back up and got hurt um, from a car fl flying through the flashing lights. And I've witnessed that. So I think there's um, some sort of monitoring or tracking of that. I don't know if the signs are big enough or if the lights are, bright enough, but I know that on, um, on uh, is it West Avenue? Yeah. People well, tend to West Avenue, yes. fly through those signs. We just put a new one on East Avenue. I'm the sorry? Latest, the, the, the last one that Champion installed was on East Avenue, right before the green, where we just had that pedestrian crossing. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly the sign that we are putting in. Um, Martin Luther King, you're saying that is the area? Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's right right where the old clock used to be. So, you know, they put those two. Um, there's, I think there's three of them, maybe. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I darling, you put them up by Grace Baptist. By Grace Cap Baptist Church. Yeah, right. yeah that's right. what I'm talking about. It's a dangerous intersection, even with those lights fla flashing. And, well, and, it's because uh, cars uh, run through the cars run, run through, through the. I, 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 I've had people actually send me videos of them pressing the light, trying to cross the street, and cars flying through, and they've backed up. I've even been in my car and actually seen people just go through those those uh, signs. Yeah, and Councilman Langella, um, I, I agree with our uh, Councilwoman um, Young. And then also, too, I think the problem starts from there's a recessed uh, light on Martin Luther King Jr., so okay. people will run that light even with the adaptive measures. Now people people speed up to run that light and fly through, and because they're still they've like so. I, yeah. I mean, I know it's an enforcement thing, and that's like things that we can't do. But like we need to, um, you know, I almost witnessed somebody get hit the other day. So it really stems from people trying to speed through that recessed light on Martin Luther King Jr. And that's why <laughs> then it's such a short short period of time before you reach that crosswalk. That that's what's really it's happening. Um, so. Or coming from the other direction. Yeah. If you're heading off of 15 and you're coming down this, coming down into South Norwalk and you're at a clip at a speed and you've got a green light, you, you really don't see that flashing light. Can, can everyone please state your name before you, before you um, say anything? And we have a question from Tom Keegan. He has his hand up. Okay. Yes, Tom. Yeah, yeah hi. Um, if you can hear me, just to speak to what uh, Darlene is saying, uh, a universal problem, this is about, you know, we need to hit the reset button when we're behind the wheel of our car. And um, I, I think this is relatively new technology. So 
I, I think people aren't used to what those flashing lights mean. Um, we may want to speak to our state legislators in that they can compel driver education courses to cover this kind of stuff um, in their uh, curriculum. So I, I, I think it's a, a bigger problem than, you know, just the one light bulb right. by, by the church. It's, it's, it's something I've heard. I've, I've had people who have been talking about this on, uh, you know, social media, et cetera, et cetera. Just my, you know, feelings on it. I'm sorry, Tom, we missed that last part. You were breaking up towards the end. Tom? Uh, Barbara Smith has her hand up also. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, I agree with um, what Mr. Keegan was saying, but additionally, I wonder if we could uh, think about cameras in those particular spots um, in terms of enforcement. You know, like they do in New York City, you run through a light and you get a ticket in the mail a few days later. Um, so maybe initially it could be a warning um, and then a ticket or something like that, but just something to think about for the future as um, cameras in those spots. Uh, Barbara, I think that's a great idea. I think that's something we should probably bring up with traffic and mobility and mm -hmm. have them look into it and come up with some options for us and ideas. But again, we're just, we are voting to get these right now, so we are in favor of getting them, right? You bet. Especially in that West Avenue area, it, it is a little scary and it does get a little threatening with uh, the cars going by there. You're probably right, they're just not used to seeing that there. They're not really familiar with it. And uh, maybe this is something we bring up with traffic and mobility. Darlene, Mr. Mr. Yeah. Chair, I'm sorry. Okay, let's start with Darlene and then Tom, you're next. Okay. But, so just another area is the Flax Hill area as well. Um, and so I did mention this to um, traffic and mobility um, and shared with them um, the information that I received. Okay, thank you. Mr. Livingston? Yeah, thank you. I just wanna note, and, and Mr. Keegan probably knows this better than anybody, that, that the state law does not inf permit um, inf uh, traffic to be enforcement through cameras, as I understand it. You can't issue a ticket like they're doing other states in Connecticut. So, I mean, can't, so we can't do that. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Vanessa, did you have something to add? I thought I saw your hand up. Um, I was just gonna say that I'm gonna pass all the information back to TMP with all the concerns. Perfect, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Anything else anybody would like to add? All right, seeing none, I'm gonna put it up for a vote. Uh, Ms. Smith. There yes, you go. I thought we voted already. Did we? We did, yeah. We did. Oh, yes, we did. And then Darlene started the conversation. The <laughs> All right, so it's a go, it's a go. And we have a lot of good information for traffic and mobility. Okay. Items nine and 10, I'm gonna read them again together because they have to do with the same. So start off with item nine. Acknowledge the receipt of the request for the honorary naming of the portion of Chestnut Street from Monroe Street to Merritt Place to Officer Cesar Ramirez Drive. Item 10, <clears throat> from the Office of the Mayor and the Chief of Police. Schedule a public hearing for the honorary naming of the portion of Chestnut Street from Monroe Street to Merritt Place to Officer Cesar Ramirez Drive. The public hearing shall be conducted in order to hear all parties interested in commenting on the proposed honorary street naming and to take such, such action on said naming that the committee may deem advisable. The public hearing is scheduled for Tuesday, May 5th, 7 p.m. The location is to be determined since we don't know as of yet if we will be back in a room or doing a, a Zoom conference again. Would anybody like to move the item? Thank you, Mr. Livingston. Mr. Livingston moves the item. Um, I, I know we've spoke about this in the past. We did send it over to the ordinance committee. They, they weighed in on it. And uh, would anybody like to add or ask any questions? Mr. Livingston. Yeah, I'll just add because I'm on the ordinance committee. This is, uh, the ordinance committee did review this and has proposed amendments to the ordinance to permit this. As you all know, previously it had to be uh, 
good for a year. Uh, so that is going to be reviewed by the Ordinance Committee tomorrow and as well by the Council, if approved by the Ordinance Committee. Any other comments? Any questions? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to put it up for a vote. Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. Keegan? Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 Mr. Langella? Yes. Mr. Livingston? Yes. And Ms. Young? Yes. All right, and I'm also a yes, so that's unanimous. All right. Mr. So, Chairman? Yes. I'm sorry. Um, I just realized that I missed another comment that I didn't read at the beginning of the meeting. So I would like to ask for exception since I didn't see the email and maybe read it now, if that's okay with you. Sure. Tom, do I have to suspend it to uh, allow this comment in or? Um, just see, I ask if there's any objection. I don't believe there will be, but. Uh, I'm assuming this is a new format right now using Zoom and we're gonna have these kind of little hiccups. So. Uh, are there any objections with allowing the comment at this time? No. Uh, no. Barbara? Mr. Theodoridi? No. All right, let, let me allow it then, Vanessa. So it is from Angelo Di Pasquale and it's he, it's more kind of a question. He says, good evening. I would like to know if a smoke test has been conducted on Cedar Road for illegal connections to resident storm gutters that are legally going into the storm drains. And if so, have those people been notified and have they disconnect those connections? That's it. Mm, that, that's a little off the agenda at hand right now. I, I know we are discussing the uh, flooding topics and that's part of it. And that is an area that we are concerned with and looking into. Uh, I don't know how much of it we could address, but we'll ask Anthony if there has been any, just to clarify that part of it. Uh, Mr. Carr, have there been any smoke tests there? Mr. Chairman, we've recently performed smoke testing in the Wall Street area uh, in late March. Uh, I'm not aware if we did perform smoke testing, I, I truthfully would have to consult my staff and get back to the committee and to the uh, to Mr. Deep as well. Do uh, you think that's something that's necessary at this point in that particular area? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. So I guess we'll put it on and uh, look into it and discuss it. All right. Mr. Chairman, what we can do, I'm going to ask customer service to fire this question and we're going to address through the, leg, the legal way that we address all the questions that come in instead of being part of the minutes. We can make as part of the minutes that will be addressed as a regular customer service request. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much, Vanessa. All right. <clears throat> Going on to information and discussion. A discussion. <clears throat> Excuse me. Presentation by Woodward and Current Engineering, uh, preliminary findings and recommendations for Dreamy Hollow Estates, Friendly Pond Area Drainage Study. I know we have a couple of representatives and we have a either slideshow or presentation that's ready to go for us. So I'm gonna hand this off to Anthony first and then he'll make the introductions and we'll see what we have. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So as the committee is aware, the city undertook a two flood study two flood studies one is in progress currently the um, junior hollow estates which includes the friendly pond area and the wolf pit areas and a broader subset of areas but just to generalize uh, the drainage area is about 400 acres uh, there's been a lot of recurring flooding in these locations um, so many a few months ago probably about the late, late summer uh, we began a flood study uh, called dreamy hollow estates which looked into a lot of the reasons of why the floodings occurring in different neighborhoods. Again, Wolf Pit, Friendly Pond, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the consultant since then has finished a preliminary report, which they'll discuss their findings and recommendations uh, in, in, a, in a few moments. But I will say that the report is different 
from any of the studies that we've done, just from the, the level of detail, the field work that was done by operations. So thank you, Ms. Vittori, to your crew, fantastic. And engineering staff too, always on point, uh, and really having a, a sound public works department with a really good consultant makes the world of the difference. And we've come up with some preliminary findings. Uh, we've assessed the problems. We have some viable options within the capital funding that we anticipate receiving for the upcoming fiscal year, which we requested $4 million for our capital project, uh, water course maintenance, which is used to fund all of our drainage improvements throughout the city. Uh, so we have two studies, Dreamy Hollow States is the first, and that's what we're here about tonight. The second study that is going on concurrently is the uh, New Canaan and Ponis Avenue uh, flood study. That was put a little bit to the back burner so we could accomplish this flood study first because the <coughs> consultant couldn't, couldn't work on both at the same time and we wanted to focus their priorities. Uh, they, done, they did an exceptional job uh, having done these types of studies when I was a consultant. Uh, I know what makes sense and what doesn't, and I know the level of, of effort that goes into these analyses. So Woodland and Curran, uh, you did a fantastic job. The staff had two internal meetings with Woodland and Curran before you review the presentation that we're gonna go through now, and they did an exceptional job. So I, I'll leave it at that. Uh, Woodland and Curran staff, I'll let the senior vice president, Anthony Catalano, introduce who's on the call, but I believe he has a few other of his colleagues there, a few that will chime in, and one who will give the technical portion of the presentation. But without further ado, uh, Mr. Catalano. Thank you, thank Chief. You and thank you everyone for, uh, for having us this evening. Uh, I, I know it's difficult, difficult times for everyone. And uh, I think we're all fortunate to have technology to be able to uh, keep things moving along. And certainly your city has been doing that. Uh, I wanna thank you for the introduction, uh, Chief. And uh, you know, we really are uh, just really getting started here. We're, we're, this, is not, this is not the end point. Uh, we've got a lot of really good information to discuss with you uh, here this evening. I did want to uh, just uh, quickly just introduce who's on the line along with myself from Wooded and Kern. We have Darren Stairs from uh, our project manager, uh, Steve Loria, senior project manager, Joe Kirby, who's our flood analysis expert. And uh, Joe will be uh, running through the, uh, the presentation and at times may get a little bit in the weeds, but then we'll kind of back off, but really want to give you all uh, a real good feel for the level of detail that we needed to, uh, to get to, to be able to understand the challenges and, and solutions that we've come up with. And, uh, and lastly, Dave White is with us also. Dave White is our stormwater practice leader and uh, we wanted him to, uh, to be on the line here as well uh, and join us also. So uh, I, I do also want to acknowledge um, the, uh, the responsiveness that we've seen uh, throughout this study to date uh, from your chief and your DPW team and the engineers. Uh, there's a lot of folks and uh, not gonna mention names because then I'm gonna end up leaving one out. And it's really been up to this point, a real team effort. And, um, you know, I really wanna emphasize that. And I, I think that, you know, you heard uh, a moment ago from the chief say this is different from other studies and it is. It's uh, much more thorough and detailed. Um, you'll see from some of the areas that we evaluated uh, really above and beyond what was done previously, but also the partnering with, um, with the department to go out in the field and do some field verification and making sure uh, you, know, you had availability on your end uh, to partner with us out in the field. Uh, there, you know, really, it, it goes a long way because it, uh, it, it avoids any any real delays, it allows the transfer of information smoothly and uh, it's refreshing to see and we really appreciate that. So I, I want you all to know that, um, uh, that we feel that way and clearly you all are in good hands. So um, what, what I wanted to do is uh, to pass it over to, uh, to Joe Kirby uh, and, and Joe will go through the details as it relates to the challenges we've identified uh, solutions, recommendations that we have. Um, certainly, uh, I'll leave it up uh, to the chairman and others. If you want to ask questions uh, as we're going through this, feel free. I don't know with Zoom uh, if, if that's something that might be cumbersome or not, but uh, more than happy to answer questions either during or after we go through, uh, go through the slides. Um, so, uh, with that, I'm going to uh, pass it over to uh, Joe Kirby, 
and you'll see up in your screen shortly uh, we're going to project the uh, the slide presentation. All set, Joe. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. I'm just trying to figure out how to share in this. Uh, the host disabled. Um, I need the host to enable sh screen sharing. Unfortunately, it says the host disabled. Okay, Joe. Sharing. Let me just find you, Joe. Okay. Joe Kirby, right? Yep. Okay. And okay, Joe, you should be should be able to do it now. All right, try it again. I will share that. Going to full screen mode. And I probably won't be able to see you guys anymore, but let me know when you can see my screen. Yep. It's all up. right. <clears throat> well, thank you, Chair, Mr. Uh, Chairman, and uh, the committee for their time tonight. And as <clears throat> Anthony mentioned, I wanted to go through and do a review of the ongoing study uh, that we have for. The Dreamy Hollow area, um, also the it's also known as uh, often referenced to the Wolf Pit area um, of town and the work we've been doing there. Um, click. All right. So just a brief overview of what I wanted to discuss. Basically, uh, a summary of the challenge: Why are we here? Why are we doing this? You know, what's the what's the issue? Uh, path to the solution. Um, we're looking at a three prong solution of moving water through this area. Um, it's a it's a complex system. Look at some of the specific study challenges and then results um, and mitigation options that we went through. And then we'll look at our initial recommendations um, and then what we discussed with uh, <coughs> the chief and his staff and the optimized alternatives that we're looking at now. So I want to start again with the the summary of the challenge. And so um, we're basically stoked to study the Dreamy Hollow area as it was defined. Um, the watershed is basically uh, this red line, um, and it's an approximate area. Um, <clears throat> the modeling, which we'll talk about in a minute, is, a, uh, is very detailed and comprehensive. So we do not just stop at the line. We allow uh, the water to tell us where it wants to go, um, because depending on how deep the water is, often it will go in multiple directions. We're looking at a 25 year storm event. Uh, that is the design storm um, in your manual and the one that you're using. Um, the, again, as Chief mentioned earlier, the study area is approximately uh, 400 acres. And <clears throat> of that acre, of that area, uh, when we map the floodplain, which you can see here, we get about 133 acres of floodplain. And one of the challenges is in our, in this case, we're only dealing with a, on average about a foot of water. Um, and typically when we go into these systems, um, you know, the like Friendly Pond, Friendly Pond, you might see six or seven feet, but once we get up into uh, Saddle or Surrey, um, then we're dealing with only, you know, a, a, maybe a foot of water which can often be um, challenging to completely eliminate and to get moving uh, through the system. Uh, we do get a good bit of infiltration. We, this is a rainfall runoff model, which basically means that we, we let, we rain on <coughs> the area and allow the water to go and build up where it, where it wants to and where it does uh, normally. And of the rainfall, the 6.4 uh, inches of rain, uh, about three inches actually soaks into the ground and doesn't come out as runoff. But that leaves us with uh, about 121 acre feet of water left to deal with. Again, I wanted to talk a little bit more about this model. Um, this is a, a rain on grid model. It's a very uh, comprehensive model. It allows us to, um, to basically uh, change a pipe anywhere in the system and see its effect on the whole system. Um, 
the big advantage of that is, especially in this case, and we'll talk about a, a couple of runs in the future. I'm sure it's really hard to see, but the pipes are in here. Um, this is the ground elevation. This is Friendly Pond. Um, and uh, we use, again, a grid that we, we allow rain to fall on, and then it runs where it may based on the terrain itself and the piping system. And you can see the water running through the system out to Betts Brook out here, uh, flooding the low, the low part and then running out to the river. Oh, let me go to the next. <clears throat> so the, our path to a solution is three pronged. We're looking for uh, as much storage, if we can find some place that's, that's appropriate for the water to be or to sit. Uh, we're looking for those areas. We're looking to eliminate flooding by getting better conveyance to these storage areas. So even if we get the storage area, we need to get the water there in a reasonable amount of time so that doesn't pond up um, in our neighborhoods and in people's yards. Um, and then also we need to get better conveyance to the river. So we need to look at the, the flow paths going to the river and um, figuring out ways to get it there quicker um, so that again, the water doesn't pond up where we don't want it to. Initially, um, we had looked at um, four different storage areas and five different scenarios. Um, we looked at uh, Friendly Pond in two ways. There's a big public lot out there. Uh, so we looked at just working within that lot to store water, and then we expanded it uh, to a reasonable but conservative area um, to store more water. And we found that of all the water going to the pond, we could store about uh, 10 to 14 percent of it, which are reasonable numbers. But we're looking if we really truly want to use it as storage to hold water throughout an event, we're looking for, you know, 20 to 25 percent or higher. Um, the next area we looked at is a uh, piece of land right next to Dreamy Hollow apartment complex. Um, it's actually uh, a stream and some uh, wooded area. And there was a lot of information that came to us during our uh, workshops when, with the workshops with the city that there was a lot of flooding happening at the end of this. And so we looked at storing water there. Uh, we found that it was very inefficient to store water. We might be able to present some of the flooding there, but it wasn't a very uh, efficient storage area. Um, the fourth area we looked at was uh, Wolf Put School. They have a big soccer field just down the hill from the school. We looked at putting underground storage there. Um, we actually got a good percentage of the volume that goes to it to be able to store. Uh, the biggest challenge we had is that not an, this total area was not significant enough uh, storage to prevent flooding just downstream. And we'll talk a little bit more about how this flooding happens and occurs um, to, to explain that. But it really wasn't effective at drying up this area, even if we stored the water there. Then finally, we looked at Andrews Field. Um, Andrews Field is a big detention pond uh, functionally today. Um, when we ran the calcs on that, we built a berm to keep it in the field, basically, to, to keep it off the parking lot and to uh, store up more water. Uh, and reduce the outflow. But because the connection from here to Friendly Pond is quite restricted, um, there really aren't any large piping systems conveying. Uh, there's not a major trunk line that conveys water down here. And the water would just typically sit on the parking lot instead of on the back of our berm. Um, it was more of a wash. It really didn't store any more water um, than what it's storing today. Uh, we looked at <coughs> conveyance to storage. The two uh, primary trunk lines that we looked at are uh, this one that runs up friendly and then over to saddle. Um, these are two uh, major trunk lines in the study area and then this one that runs up into Surrey. Um, both of these trunk lines are uh, do not have the capacity to cover, to carry the 25 year event. Um, and there is a little bit of disrepair, at least in the, uh, in the friendly one, um, that should be considered when we, uh, we start making decisions on, on what to do. We also looked at some, um, new conveyance areas, um, different ways to convey water to, again, friendly pond where we'd like to store it, uh, temporarily before we moved it out. Um, 
and there was a just to mention it there was a typo in your your pdf there's saddle road conveyance um we looked at can the, of upgrading some pipes adding some new pipes up saddle and then connecting these two conveyance areas um this did do a a good bit of work drying out some of this area but really um was not so cost effective uh to do um so it's a it's it's a it was a good alternative to look at uh, but did not give us the the return on investment we were we were really looking for uh, another option we looked at was you know if we could just pump it all away what what would happen um, so we put a pump station up here on a cc um, but then we had to upgrade these uh, backyard uh, drainage systems because the water is ponding in these these backyard areas and we'll talk about that um, in, a, in a couple of minutes, but um, in order to get the water to the pump station. And really, we were, we were really getting large in pipe size. We had to start connecting other systems. Um, so we were just getting two costs that, that would far exceed the budget. So, but that was definitely an option we looked at and, and wanted to consider. Um, conveyance to the river, uh, a couple addition, uh, different options here, just looking at the, the current path um, over Dry Hill Road here and then over uh, Newton Ave, uh, there are two piping systems. We looked up upgrading both of those systems um, and evaluating how, what that effect had. And then we also looked at, even though it's outside our study area at uh, Betts or uh, Newton Pond Dam, removing that dam, that dam is not very large, but it does back up water about a half a mile up Betts Brook. Um, so it does hold a lot of water um, in the system and doesn't allow it to flow. And at this point, um, the stream gets a lot steeper and so it'll convey a lot more water. Um, so taking this out does, does drop the water surface and would allow for better conveyance through here. Um, we also looked at an additional conveyance path uh, to uh, Betts Brook and, and then on to the river. Um, this is the modeled one, which is just straight, but we do route it, um, um, you know, just on, on paper to, to get a good estimate. Um, but it does show significant uh, reductions in floodplain when we do this. Um, this picture here on the right, the green, the green is the old floodplain. The blue is the new floodplain. And again, even though the edge of our study area is here, um, the we've expanded it so we get a good tailwater. We'll talk about that in a minute. The uh, but we do get a good reduction. We get an over a foot reduction on Betts Brook, and we get about a foot reduction in um, Friendly Pond. And these reductions, you know, continue upstream all the way up into sorry, all the way up to this is uh, Wolf Pit School. So you can see little pieces of green. Here and there, these are these these runs are um, not just this, but the storage area, this this pipe, and then reduction here of the dam, or elimination, excuse me, of the dam. Um, but it does show considerable promise um, to find a new way to convey water uh, to Betts Brook from Friendly Pond. Um, so some of the study challenges. Um, looking at infrastructure. This is our Friendly Pond uh, Saddle Road trunk line, um, goes up Saddle, um, I think that's Daphne and then, or Saddle, Daphne and then Friendly, and then into Friendly Pond. As you can see, this is the profile of the pipeline here. Um, this is the water surface elevation just to help you see the different elevations through the pipe. Um, and our challenges are all these adverse slopes. And these are typically from pipe settling um, in the ground. And, you know, basically you have pipes that are sloping the wrong direction. Um, they're not sloping towards the outlet, they're sloping towards the inlet. Um, then this brown line is the uh, ground surface. So as you can see, the, it's actually the road surface. As you can see, the pipes aren't very deep. This is a um, saddle road area here. And then our outlet, the Friendly Pond. And the biggest challenge when you have pipes that are sloping in the wrong direction is you're not getting the movement of water that you're expected. And when we look at this pipe, this graph, it just shows that we're getting about 11 and a half 
uh, CFS. And we should see about six times that in a pipe this size. So this is very inefficient system, not moving as much water as it could, even at the size of the pipes that it has in it. Um, the backyard sumps, uh, the two major uh, flooding areas and the areas we concentrated on, this is Friendly Ponds. And, and I know these pictures are a little bit hard to see, especially if you're using a phone, but what I was trying to show, and if, uh, if we weren't using all this technology tonight, I could have animated it for you, but the, uh, these lines, these arrows are the direction of the water flow. And this is, this is Saddle Road. There are houses uh, right along here, just to the to the right of this this road line here, and then this is the backyard, and this is the area where you can see the lines are going in a circle, and the water is basically ponding here, um, and this is pretty much the the height of the storm, and there are several paths in which the water is flowing into these backyards, um, and it continues to flow. Um, this one over here, this is uh, the Surrey Road sump. This is Surrey Road right here. Uh, again, the height of the storm, the houses are laying right in here. And all this yellow area, which is the deeper water um, or yellow or green areas, uh, this is the area behind the houses that the, excuse me, uh, let me previous. Uh, this is the area where the water is ponding up. And it's very difficult once it gets in here to get it out unless we put drainage in here, which is uh, why I assume the residents have put uh, drainage in here. Um, another view of this, and uh, if I can get to move forward, something I did want to animate. Um, this is an animation, and again, depending on what type of monitor you're using, it might be hard to see, but you can see uh, little uh, lines moving through these pipelines. Um, and I won't spend a lot of time on this because it's hard to see, but the important part is there's a pipe here that connects the, the drainage in the backyards of all these houses. This is Saddle Road again. So this is that sump area. And soon, once this starts to flood, you'll see the direction of water reverse and it will start, water will start running from the road through the pipe system into the backyard. And this, this happens for two hours. So for two hours, water is flowing overland and through this pipe into the backyard. Um, and then it does this until the uh, until the storm subsides and there's enough room for water to flow out. And again, that inefficient pipe that we're talking about that only flows about 11 CFS of water, that's right here. So this is one of the, the challenges with this area, this area of flooding. Um, another issue and uh, limitation is sedimentation and uh, overgrowth of a lot of your storage areas. This is Friendly Pond. When I first started this project, I looked really hard on the map, looked for a pond and could never find one. And then I found the label of the, the treat area that was once Friendly Pond. Um, but as you can see in this photo here, this is the inlet pipe. So all the work you're doing today for the dredging of these conveyance areas will add considerable amount of storage to the this area but also um, the ability to flow water much better. When we uncover this pipe and allow it to flow water um, from here with a smooth path to the outlet, it'll flow considerably more, more water through the system. So our model, um, uh, the, the, big, the big thing here, we did, the, we did the modeling as scoped, but we did add a few extra parts of the model. We modeled uh, Betts Brook um, and we modeled that for two reasons. One, we wanted to get a really good, what we call tailwater or known condition for our outlet of our model. Um, we really want to get a good understanding of what the water is doing on Betts Brook. And as you saw in uh, previous animation, how Betts Brook would fill up with water as Friendly Pond drains. We wanted to understand that better. We also wanted to understand what the impacts uh, we had when we start doing, when we start moving more water through the system faster, you know, that will, yes, remove flooding upstream, but it could cause flooding downstream. So we wanted to understand those impacts and that will allow us to do this by extending this model to Betchbrook. Uh, for the um, hydrology, and as I said, we did rain on grid for our normal, our scope study area, but for this area, we used existing uh, study information, um, 
and applied that to the stream so that we had a flood condition on that stream at the same time we were trying to move water out of a friendly pond, which gives us a, a much more realistic answer than if we just assumed you know, some standard condition at the end of a pipe. Um, then we also included uh, the residential drainage systems in those two sump areas uh, at Friendly and Surrey in order to get a better understanding of that flow, even though typically the pipes there are uh, smaller than we normally model, um, but because they are the main uh, drain it, the source of drainage for those two areas, it was important to include those also. <clears throat> the, uh, again, this was a, a very, uh, complex uh, area and how the water moves and how slowly or quickly it runs. So we ended up coming up and working around 22 different improvements um, that 22 different things that we could do that would improve either flow, storage, or conveyance uh, in or out of the system. And we modeled those in about 28 different scenarios, uh, nine of, 19 of which we're showing here. Um, and again, we looked at those as storage uh, conveyance from Friendly Pond and conveyance uh, to Friendly Pond. And we mixed and matched improvements to try to figure out um, what the best solutions were. In doing that, we monitored all these runs, all these uh, different analyses at a little over 50 different points um, throughout the study area. Um, this is the area, again, of... Uh, of Surrey Road, um, Saddle Road, um, CC, And these are the areas, these points are all picked out for areas of intense flooding. And what we're looking for uh, is we measure the depth at each scenario and we compare it against the existing conditions depths. We also put in some uh, 2D cross sections to allow us to look at flow across the ground. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy to look at uh, flow through pipes, but when you're looking at flow across the ground, you need a, a little different way to capture and, and metrics it. Um, you won't be able to read this slide, uh, but green is good, yellow is better. Uh, this is all the detail. This is how I look at it. That's how I try to share it with the DPW staff so we can compare things um, apples to apples. We do summarize this information down to streets. So as we look here on Sowell Road, um, you know, we have different alternatives here. One of the better alternatives for all the saddle road points is this alternative 300, which uh, gives us anything from uh, 0.1 improvement to 0.7 feet improvement of, uh, of reduced flooding depths. Um, and we can look at this in a little different way. Uh, we can look at this at the points themselves. So again, this is saddle, a CC, Surrey. Um, and uh, let's take this point here, saddle road number seven, there's, you know, depending on the scenario, we're 0.2 to 0.9 feet of reduction, which again, remembering our average flooding is 0.9, although in this area, it's definitely a little deeper, but mostly behind the houses is where all the water is piling up into feet. Most of the roads uh, do not carry much more than uh, six inches to a foot of water. Um, so these, uh, these reductions are significant. So our preliminary mitigation options, these were the options that kind of showed the, the most uh, maybe bang for the buck is the easiest way to say it. Uh, things we were looking at that, um, that uh, seemed to, to make the biggest difference, um, you know, depending on how they were implemented. Um, we'll go into these in detail, but just generically, uh, restoration of friendly pond and restoration to wetlands. Um, not a pond. This would be just removing all the overgrowth instead of just in the channels and the sediment, allowing for uh, considerably more storage in this area. Then again, <clears throat> upgrading our path uh, to that storage area we've just created. Um, we were looking at the friendly and saddle uh, road trunk line, and that's because it it's in need of repair and it's physically connected to both those sumps, the saddle and Surrey neighborhood sumps. Um, and then Peru, no, excuse me, improved conveyance to the river or out of Friendly Pond. And the best alternative we've really come up with is the uh, Friendly Pond, a new outlet, a new pipe that runs from Friendly Pond to just probably downstream of the dam. Um, 
um, but a more economical one might be a dry hill that was also showing some reduction in promise. So looking at uh, friendly pond restoration, um, this was the area. And again, this is a conservative area, not the design area um, that we looked at for storing water. Um, it takes in about uh, the 25 year van off 370 acres. Um, and I think this should be 121 acre feet of water into, into this pond um, and about 14% of the volume. We estimated the cost at about $3 million. But unfortunately, when we look at this scenario, we look at all scenarios uh, or all improvements in a couple different ways. We look at them by themselves, and then we also look at them in conjunction with other improvements. And so by itself, it really doesn't do a significant, a significant amount of improvement upstream. And the reason is, is because it gets a lot of water from downstream. Uh, when this area is dug out, a lot of these systems that uh, come in up here, even this system backflows uh, the main system through dry hill backflows into the pond. Um, and it, it's really interesting to watch when you visualize that it, it flow, you can see the pond fill from, from the outlet. So it really didn't do a lot by, its own, by itself, but a little bit of storage and conveyance through this area is definitely an improvement needed um, to make all solutions, all solutions work. Um, so conveyance to the storage, again, we're looking at um, the friendly saddle uh, trunk. Uh, we estimated at, uh, at two to 2.3 million, depending on how much of it is updated um, and, and replaced. And if you're, you know, the, the goal would be to completely drain this area. Um, so we are looking at some good reductions of, of 0.1 to, to two feet. Um, now the challenge with this, again, we need something down here. We can, if we can get the water here, we need some place for that water to go. And that's why this is a, all, all three pieces are needed um, to make a good solution. We also looked at dwell times, which is how long the water sits here. And um, although sometimes the reduction in water is not significant, you can get a, a good reduction in how long the water actually sits on the ground. So how long is the water backing up into this area? Um, and how long does it sit in the street? And so we were looking at 1.5 to 10 hours of reduction depending on the scenario. And conveyance to the river. Uh, so we go to Betts Brook and Betts Brook carries it to the river. Um, again, the, the best scenario, um, <clears throat> the best alternative we have found is to make a new outfall from Friendly Pond uh, to the river. Um, it, is, it is a costly one, it's about 3.2 million, um, but it does do a significant reduction um, in, in water surface elevation on the pond. And as you've seen upstream and upstream of, of Friendly Pond itself, a lot of the reductions we showed in the last slide, you need reductions in Friendly Pond to make that happen. Um, dwell times, there's actually a negative dwell time here. Again, that's just looking at the numbers. That means uh, somewhere downstream, it's, you know, the water can't flow out as quickly. Um, and so it, it sits there a little longer. Uh, but anyways, from <clears throat> minus one hour, so an added hour or 10 hours in reduction. Um, a much less uh, costly option is um, increasing uh, the pipes through Dry Hill. Uh, there's a significant water surface elevation change here. Um, so increasing this would help level that and help water move, although it does help it move in both directions, um, depending on the timing. But um, it did give us a, a good reduction of uh, 0.2 to 1.1. Um, and dwell times were only, only downstream actually were the reductions. Then finally, the dam. The dam was actually looked at in a different study, so we we didn't um, we didn't do a scenario just specifically for the dam. So I don't have the reductions in dwell times yet, but uh, we were looking at 0.3 just to remove the dam and restore the stream stream there. So from our our meeting with the chief and his staff, uh, we've come up with the preliminary recommendations, and really uh, kind of a hybrid solution. Um, impacts to keep the cost uh, under 4 million, uh, which we were informed of the budget and accommodation 
a combination of the following options. So again, we're still, we still need the three pieces. We need the storage conveyance and uh, conveyance to the river, but we're looking to, to put this together and maintain our budgets. So with that, we're gonna build off uh, the work that DPW is doing now. This is gonna add a significant amount of storage, the dredging of the channels um, through the area. It'll also allow very good flow through um, the system. So um, we're gonna build off this and use this as our, our storage and, uh, and conveyance system. This will significantly improve the, um, the conditions of flooding uh, throughout the whole system because right now, again, water pops into here, then kind of has to pop up and you know, run in multiple directions to get through uh, Friendly Pond. There's not a really good flow path through it at the current time. Um, with that, we're gonna look at options to upgrade uh, the trunk line that we've been discussing on uh, <clears throat> then ends up here on saddle. Um, again, it is connected to both of the, the uh, the sump areas, so it is a it's a it's a good one to work on, and it has some challenges. So we're going to kind of look at three options, which we're doing now. Uh, looking at full replacement, we're looking at replacement of basically half of it, and then an interconnect to um, honeysuckle. And the reason for the interconnect to honeysuckle, a lot of the drainage um, into this system comes from honeysuckle. Um, and then we were also looking at a partial trunk line upgrade. I did wanna show you a little bit of uh, preliminary results just to just to kind of maybe do two things, show you a little bit more about how the model works and how you, know, you can change things in one area and see results in a different area. But again, this is the conveyance area we talked about. Uh, we did an initial run where we updated this whole system. We added the conveyance change, you know, the, the new dredged channels to this to Friendly Pond. And in the same color scheme as we had before, blue is uh, a, the new floodplain, green is the existing. And as you can see, we have made some improvements already, but not where we expected them. You know, we would have expected more improvements up here, but one of the things this model tells us is that water is moving um, from over here down through this area and across uh, a CC road over to Surrey Road and actually getting conveyed to Friendly Pond through this system. So there's a lot of water transferring here. And this system that we now put in, it, yes, it didn't improve the ponding here, but it did reduce it enough to not allow water to go this way and get into the system. So this is one of the advantages of the model we're, we're using. This is the initial run without improvements downstream. So um, you know, this will definitely change and improve, but we want to evaluate these three scenarios to do that. But this is a kind of an important point on how it works and, and the insights we get from the modeling in the system. All right, um, conveyance to the river. Uh, uh, we look at putting in, uh, this is the routed system. Um, <clears throat> this is Friendly Pond over here and I, don't know all the names of these roads. I guess this is uh, Newtown Ave here. Um, we understand there's a big pipe in there and we're, we're looking at that also. Um, but we're looking at this trunk line coming down through here. And again, this is our most uh, bang for the buck. We're also looking at uh, removing this dam uh, as an option itself. And then in conjunction with these other features, again, just to give you some preliminary results, this is kind of our first run results here. Um, this is Friendly Pond. This is ponding above Blake Street on um, Brent Brook. The reduction of flooding here, putting in this trunk line is over a foot just in the base run. And that's all because we're just, instead of running the water up and over and then through the culvert at, at Blake, uh, we're running it directly to uh, the part of the Betts Brook that can convey the, the flow. Um, we also have a half a foot reduction on Friendly Pond, which can receive more water now from the, the runs up here. So all these things, uh, all these <coughs> recommendations are, are tied together. We will look at them as a, as a, uh, as a whole and uh, come up with a final solution. 
uh, final recommendation. So our next steps are to finalize our models, runs, and costing. Um, that should be done in the next couple of weeks. Uh, finalize the report. And then with your approval, move on to design permitting of preferred alternatives. So with that, I hope I haven't taken up too much of your time and I'll take any questions. Mr. Chair, this is Tom Livingston, I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions actually. Um, one, I, I understand you're using the 25 year uh, flood and, and uh, I understand why, uh, but I'm just curious how we should think about that in terms of the increasing uh, number of more than 25 year floods. I mean, how does that affect your model other than more flow? I mean, is it something else we should think about? Uh, it, is that gonna create a whole different a slew of problems? That, that's question one you can answer. And the second one is, and I think you just sort of alluded to in your, your closing comment about permitting and whether you think that would be a significant issue in terms of what you're proposing. But those are my questions, thank you. Uh, to the uh, a couple notes on the on the first question. First, we do run, um, we're running, I believe, five different scenarios from the five year up through the hundred year um, uh, flood condition for the modeling. But there is a certain level of protection that that one we can provide and two we can afford. And so right now that, and I believe it's right out of your design manual to be the twenty five year event. Um, and we do look at the, our, so our primary scenario is the 25 year event that we look at um, and model to, but we do also uh, look at and we'll map as part of our final report, the additional uh, scenarios and higher flooding events. Um, and then permitting, um, it, permitting is not really my area, my toss is to Anthony. I would say, this. Joe, I would, I would, I could, this is Anthony Catalano. Uh, one of the key things that we focus on um, as we move towards uh, the next step is uh, to refine cost estimates and to uh, understand what the permitting strategy is. Um, and you know, if, if we're going to be going into some sensitive areas to be doing some improvements, what does that mean in terms of uh, permitting needs and schedule and that sort of thing? So we're prepared to um, address that as we continue to advance the ball here forward so that really we look at our job being creating a, a very clear roadmap for the city to follow to move towards implementation and you're hundred percent correct that uh, permitting is definitely one of the factors it's it's the technical stuff it's the cost estimating and it's regulatory compliance okay thank you chairman David white has his hand up um, um, th thank you. Um, this is Dave White. Um, one thing I want to also emphasize with the presentation that Joe made relative to your first question, Mr. Livingston, is the fact that um, the rainfall data that we're using is the higher projected rainfall data is considering some climate technology changes, climate climate changes. Um, so the 6.4 inches of rainfall for 24, 24 hour event on a 25 year storm is a fairly, a very intense rainfall event, more so than what you would traditionally have looked at in the past. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Joe, thank you for that presentation. It was very detailed. I also had a couple of questions. <clears throat> Regarding the Newton Dam, is that we're going to is that going to require additional additional permits, or are, are the permits we've recently obtained good enough to with, to remove a dam? If I, this is Anthony. What I would say is, uh, Chief, I think it's important that we understand um, the specifics of the permit that you have for that now. And uh, you know to what extent it's a permit modification versus uh, you know no significant change or what have you. I think that we'll probably have to take a closer look at that. I don't think we have reviewed that information from you yet, Chief. Okay, thank you. It was George Cernides, by the way, Anthony. Thank you. No also, problem. Uh, that part we mentioned about those those pipes, the, the ones that weren't pitched correctly. 
How much rain do you, do you think it takes or anticipate it takes before they start back flowing until it reaches that point where now the pitch is off and the rain starts going back to the houses? It, the uh, It's actually, um, it's immediate. I mean, because if you don't get enough rain, it doesn't, you have to fill the pipe. And if I can go back to that slide, um, let me just shoot back there. Um, you, you need enough water to fill up these pipes before it will flow over the top of basically this hill. If you look at it as, you know, it's going downhill. So before it flows over the top here, you had, you need to fill up the pipe and the, um, I'm trying to think of where that, that, that pipe that goes to the backyards is. I think it's in here somewhere. Um, so it, when you look at that, um, when you look at that animation I showed, which is probably pretty hard to see unless you got a, a large screen, the the water is immediately flowing in, in the reverse direction. It's filling up this pipe as soon as it starts to rain. Hmm. Okay, so we're not seeing any of the benefit of the, the, pat, the pipe past that where it is pitched correctly. Correct. Okay. Until, until you, you fill up the pipe enough that it comes over. Okay, are there any other questions? Anybody, would anybody else? Uh... Is there anything else anybody would like to add? Mr. Carr? Yeah. So Mr. Catalano and Mr. Kirby either can answer this, but, and we touched upon it earlier about how this is different from other, other studies. Uh, we don't need to necessarily go into that, that level of detail, which Mr. Kirby has uh, very well demonstrated that this is an in-depth analysis, um, but I wanted to manage expectations and just, if you could hit upon the difference of flood mitigation uh, and flood elimination and, and, and what the intent of this study is. And I think that it's, it's important that the Common Council, the committee and the residents who are watching this, uh, as we've openly and outwardly um, managed expectations that this is not the, the silver bullet. This isn't gonna be where you walk out of the backyard and uh, you have the hundred year storm around you and you're just the only people, people who are dry. Um, there are other areas of the city that we need to work on next. And believe me, correct me if I'm wrong, to invest uh, the amount of money to, to, to really remedy the entire situation and make it a flood elimination project, you're in the magnitude of 10 to $20 million. Is, is, is that correct? Yeah, I, I would say uh, I'll start with, um, you know, we, you know, Chief, we, we'd love to give you the silver bullet, but, you, you know, you heard the challenges. This is really kind of a, a unique area that's been studied. And I think case in point is, you know, we initially started this thinking that, you know, maybe five or six different areas uh, you know, do, you know, five to 10 runs and, you know, we'll have our answer and we're done. And, you know, as you start to dig deeper and see some of these site challenges, um, you know, at the end of the day, it ended up going from that to, you know, maybe close to uh, 28 or 30, what you saw earlier. And so it's, it's really more about improving conditions. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're smart to, to put it that way, because, um, you know, when you talk about managing um, existing conditions and having improvements, you look at it from lowering elevations, uh, shorter flood duration time, the things that Joe hit, uh, hit on in his uh, presentation itself. So really what we're looking to do is to improve conditions um, obviously keeping an eye on cost. It's no blank check. And, and so there is definitely a cost benefit aspect to this. And, you know, I mean, it's tough to, you know, throw out numbers, but, you know, we've seen projects where, you know, numbers have gone in the 10 to 15 to 20 million range. And, you know, you really need to start to question, what are we getting for the, that additional 15 million? Uh, again, when you're dealing with a challenged, uh, challenging area and site conditions, uh, it gets to the point where it's diminishing returns. You're paying all this money for not very much more. And so our, our job is to try to strike that balance, which we think we've done at the, up to this point. Um, we're just about there. I think this hybrid solution is a good one. And you know, once we finalize the model runs, as Joe said, over the next couple of weeks, uh, we think we're going to be in a really good spot where we where we will strike that balance and stay, uh, you know, fiscally responsible, 
uh, within the budget allocation, but really have some meaningful results. So, I mean, really that's our goal. Okay, Anthony Catalano, thank you very much. Thank you and your team. Oh, thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, Manny Langella, um, I just wanna say thank you. This presentation was awesome. And um, I think really in the executive summary, I, we need to managing expectations is gonna be the most important part because um, my, my major comment was just the point of diminishing returns, like how much money we actually invest versus what we can see from like uh, improvements. So I think um, I just wanna stress, make sure we <laughs> thank you for that. And um, you know, I appreciate um, you guys have already looked into that too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what we didn't really talk a lot about is that, you know, ultimately right now we're presenting results, all the work that's been done, it's going to really all culminate into uh, pulling it all together in a report. And of course, with an executive summary, you know, we call it kind of the cheat sheet where you can refer to it and get your uh, information without having to dig through all the details. So as we typically do, our intent is to include an executive summary uh, that uh, provides really, you know, the results, what we've done, and then ultimately the uh, uh, the preferred recommendation or preferred alternative, so we could start to move forward and start to see some real results at some point in the field. Nice. Thank you for your comment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any, anyone else? Any other comments? Chairman, this is Paul Sotnik. Yes, Paul. Hi. Uh, I, I'd like to ask uh, Joe and Anthony Catalano, uh, one of the things that they just touched uh, about is basically they're going to be issuing their final report and then we that go to design and permitting phases. Would you guys please explain a little more detail what steps will be required to go from this study to actually putting a shovel in the ground and starting construction. Yep, sure. So uh, the, the first uh, order of business here is for us to wrap up the modeling with this uh, hybrid solution that we discussed uh, this evening. Um, once that's complete and the report is done, Paul, uh, the intent is to move into uh, what, what we typically do is to go into a uh, a multi-phase design process so that we can continue to partner closely with uh, the engineering department. And uh, really what we wanna do is to not get too far ahead of ourselves during the design process. So typically what we'll do is we'll take the, uh, you know, call it, uh, you know, conceptual planning, preliminary design to a certain extent of these analyses, take that information and develop 30% uh, design level documents, um, which would start to lay things out on a plan, right? So how do you do that? We need to coordinate with the engineering department. Are there additional surveys that are needed to supplement what's, what's already been done? We need to notify the, the uh, engineering department of that. Once we have all that and assume we have the survey information we need to create these base maps, um, then we start to get into that design process and that 30% design will start to uh, advance the concepts uh, that we have here from this analysis. Um, and then that next step after that, once we uh, continue to move forward and get comments, address those comments is to move to a 60% design process. And then after that, uh, it's close to final. Again, you could kind of understand the process that we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. We want to make sure we're all on the same page every step of the way. Time is money. You don't want to take one step forward and two steps back. And uh, communication is really the key during that design process. Once that's complete and the design documents are done and we have plans and specifications, we incorporate them as part of a set of bid documents. And those bid documents essentially will include the plans and specifications together what we call front end documents, which are typically more of the, the legal documents, your, your bid forms, your notice to bidders, your insurance requirements, that all gets packaged together so that the city could then issue that out to contractors who then would submit bids uh, on, on, on the project itself. And then we work together with the city to evaluate the bids. And based on that analysis, the city uh, makes a, a selection on a preferred contractor, and then the work starts. 
if the city was to move ahead fairly soon or in the near future with the budgets we're talking about any kind of time frame roughly this is not something that happens overnight it's going to be a little bit yeah it's, it's you're, you're exactly right what i would say is you know we want to get through this modeling phase right here our, our intent is to do our best to start to see results this year and uh, have some activity out in the field this year. Uh, what, what we intend to do is to continue as we have been updating the city, uh, as we continue to move forward in each, you know, each step here. Um, so uh, what I would say, Paul, is uh, once, once the modeling is complete and the report is done and we develop that game plan for the design process, we then sit with you all and start to lay out uh, a more formal schedule. I think at that point, it'll be more clearly defined. As you could see from this study itself, there were a lot of iterations, a lot more than the city or anyone else uh, anticipated, and rightfully so, given the challenges out there. So um, once you get all the modeling work done and you know the direction you're headed in, it'll be a lot easier to develop that implementation schedule. And if we could work with you to do that, and we can update the committee here um, as frequently as you'd like, just to kind of keep them up to speed and um, understand the progress that we're making. Thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you for all of your hard work, Woodward and Karen and your staff. Oh, no, absolutely, Paul. And thank you to the committee for giving us this time uh, to speak. We appreciate it. All right, anybody else? Are there any other questions? All right, seeing none, uh, again, Anthony, thank you very much to you and your, your team. That was a lot of great work. Uh, Anthony Carr, thank you, Public Works. You guys have been working really diligent on this. I know it's a big problem to tackle, and uh, I think you guys are taking the reins on it the right way. Uh, like you said, it's not going to happen overnight, but a lot of studying has been going on and uh, all the proper research. So hopefully we'll start seeing results, and everybody will, will start to uh, feel a little bit better about the money being spent correctly and not just being thrown in a hole for one problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess if everyone doesn't mind, it's been a long day and a long night, and uh, <laughs> it's only nine o'clock, and I still haven't eaten dinner. Oh, boy. <laughs> if you got, if anybody doesn't object, I'd like to push off the other reports till our next meeting. Or if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask right now if you if you really want to hear about them. Uh, anyone? No, I'll make a motion to adjourn, though. There you go. Thank you, Tom. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for tonight and have a good night. All right. Bye, Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Really good. Thank you. Good night, guys. Good night. Good job, George. Thanks, Tom. <laughs>